Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Sean from All Things EV and I'm coming at you from hot Phoenix, Arizona. I'm about 24 hours away from attending a Nikola tour with Trevor Milton. More on that later. Today's video is going to be a, a little sit down with the CEO of Piedmont Lithium, which as you know is a sponsor of the channel here. I've got Keith Phillips on the uh, on, on the chat here and we're gonna dive deep into lithium Keith thank you so much for number one sponsoring the channel and number two talking all things lithium Sean we're happy to do that uh, we're happy to be sponsoring you I think your product is great I really enjoy uh, you know watching your videos I'm really interested to hear the whole Nikola story by the way so that'll be fun so good for you for being in Phoenix and good luck with that Hopefully, if I don't melt, you know, <laughs> by the time I get back to Denver, it, it, it's a uh, uh, it's the reason why I moved away from Texas. At least one of the reasons why I moved away from Texas was to get away from the heat. But uh, hopefully, I can I can grin and bear it for a little while. Um, I'm 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 really excited about about diving into this topic of lithium and why lithium is important to the electric vehicle industry. As we were talking off camera, things are moving very fast. It seems like we're hearing new things about electric vehicles, about the automotive industry, whether that's on the commercial trucking side or whether that's on the uh, consumer side, something new about, about EVs and, and about zero emissions and moving away from uh, internal combustion engines to something that's a little bit more environmentally friendly. Let's, let's maybe start off at a ground level here and talk about um, Piedmont Lithium where the, where where they're located, where their 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 current project is, um, and and maybe maybe just a, a brief touch on how you ended up at Piedmont because you've got a an interesting background too. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I I, I joined Piedmont three a little over three years ago as CEO. Uh, so I spent thirty years on Wall Street as an investment banker. The last twenty of those I worked with mining companies. Uh, mostly in all different commodities, not lithium, but you know, gold and silver, uranium, coal, nickel, et cetera. Uh, I, did, I worked with a lot of bigger companies, industry leaders like Rio Tinto and Valley and BHP and, and, and a lot of smaller companies. And for the last decade or so, I worked with dozens and dozens of smaller exploration and development stage companies, kind of like Piedmont, bringing them to the U.S. capital market to raise money and ultimately positioning them to maximize shareholder value for their companies whether that was in selling assets or selling their company or, or entering into production. So a, a mutual friend of uh, mine and our founder, Piedmont's founder, Tazo Arima, put, put us together back in February of 2017. Um, mining banking was slow. I was actually down on my sofa in Florida, a condo, contemplating retirement, and I got a call uh, to, to look at this lithium opportunity. And I was initially quite skeptical. I didn't own a Tesla at the time. Uh, you know, EV penetration, and it was very, was, it, was, it was still early three and a half years ago. Uh, but I spent time studying the sector and uh, studying the company and its position and kind of rapidly learned, uh, I convinced myself that electric vehicle demand would in fact grow very strongly over time. Uh, and lithium is considered the irreplaceable element of the electric era. That's a Volkswagen phrase that I like. Uh, it's a unique uh, 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 metal and element. We can talk about that. And Piedmont had a very special place in the business. So we're in North Carolina, about 30 miles west of Charlotte, on a mineral belt called the Carolina Tin Spodumene Belt. And spodumene is, the, is a mineral that, that contains, among other things, lithium. And it's the most common source of lithium in the world. Uh, but there's only one major deposit in the United States. That is this Carolina Tin Spodumene Belt where most of the world's lithium was, was mined and produced from the 1950s to the 1980s. Uh, virtually all the world's lithium came from this belt. It's considered the cradle of the lithium business. Uh, it's a difficult place to build a land package. So some mining entrepreneurs have stayed away from it. You know, if you want to build a, a lithium project in Quebec or Western Australia or in Nevada, it's pretty easy to go online and literally stake land on government websites. Uh, remotely from your bedroom. You can't do that in North Carolina where we're literally optioning and buying pr private land and you have to go meet people and, and it takes time to build a land package. But our founders started that process and we've, we've been uh, very successful building a, a very considerable package now. I'd love for you to dive into the differences in lithium types. There's, there's different kinds and some automakers prefer one kind, others prefer 
what you're what, what you're binding. So can you go into that and talk a little bit about what they are and how how they're different? Well, there's two fundamental, you know, there's two conventional sources of lithium. You know, a hard rock spodumene, which is just you know literally quarrying, where you take a uh, you know, take the mineral out of the ground, crush it, grind it, separate it, basically upgrade it to a mineral concentrate. And then you take that concentrate into a lithium chemical plant and you convert it into lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate. And I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, then the other conventional source are brine deposits, just what they sound like, salty water, uh, typically in the Atacama Desert, Chile and Argentina represent virtually all that production. There's a small uh, producing mine in, in Nevada, a brine operation in Nevada where you typically pump this salty water to the surface uh, in the desert and you, in a series of evaporation ponds, you evaporate the water, you're left with lithium salts, which are then upgraded to lithium carbonate. So two conventional mineral sources, brine and hard rock, typically spodumene. There are some other minerals we can talk about if we want, but it's really spodumene and brine. And either one can produce lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. So brine is a favored uh, way of a technical and cost perspective to, play, to produce carbonate, uh, which is what you have in your tablet, your laptop battery, your cell phone battery, et cetera. Spodumene is, is now generally considered a lower cost way to produce lithium hydroxide, which is what you need. Uh, you know, there's, there are uses of hydroxide that are not related to uh, uh, the battery business. You use lithium in glass, in, uh, in uh, you know, a variety of industrial uses. But Fundamentally, in the battery business, lithium hydroxide is growing very quickly because most major OEMs want to maximize the range in their battery, the driving range. You know, there are these fears that uh, new adopters of EVs have that you're familiar with, uh, driving range, um, this whole concept of range, range anxiety, charging infrastructure, et cetera. One way to deal with a lot of that is to have a longer range battery. To have a longer range battery, you need to use more nickel in the cathode. Nickel you know, brings energy density. And when you use a certain amount of nickel, you have to begin to use lithium hydroxide rather than carbonate. So hydroxide, so for us, we're very fortunate. Hydroxide demand is growing more quickly. Uh, spodumene is the favored source of, uh, for hydroxide. We have the only spodumene deposit in the United States. So it's a, uh, it's a fortuitous set of circumstances as the industry has developed over the last three years that uh, you know, our, our founder had this vision to kind of go back into the TSB, the Carolina Tin Spodumene Belt, build a big spodumene business. Uh, you know, we didn't know at the time whether we would want to produce carbonate or hydroxide. Today, it's, it's obvious we would be better suited to produce hydroxide. Higher prices, faster growth, uh, et cetera, and, and lower cost to do that for us. So, so that's how our business has evolved. You're doing, you're, you're, these are open pit mines, correct, that, that you're doing in, in yeah. North Carolina? Yeah, that's right. So we're not mining yet, but historically there were two big mines in the region. Uh, the old Kings Mountain mine that Albemarle's predecessor Foot Minerals mined for 30 years. Albemarle still owns that. And then the Palm and Bean mine that Livent's predecessor, Lithium Corp of America, mined until 1999. Both of those were, I think, I think Palm and Bean was mined for 43 years, Kings Mountain about 30. So the best material in the, in the mining business, the best material tends to be, or with lowest cost mining, tends to be closer to surface before you, you know, when you're not yet into a deep hole. The deeper you go, the higher the costs are just operationally. Um, so those those mines shut down in the 80s and 90s based on what was then, you know, this is pre Elon Musk, pre Tesla, far smaller industry at the time, far less demand for lithium. And SQM in Chile had started producing lithium from brine in Chile. So Albemarle followed them down there. Livent went down to Argentina about a decade later. Uh, and they sort of left their mining operations behind and, and, and you know, we came in there. But currently, uh, we would contemplate an open pit mine. It would look just like a quarry. And in, a, in a fast growing city like Charlotte or Phoenix or Las Vegas or Denver, there are quarries all around. You can't develop highways, apartment buildings, shopping malls without aggregate gravel. And to do that, you have quarries. Ours would be a very similar operation. Um, and uh, you, you know, that's what we'll do. You could mine lithium underground. There's no technical reason why you couldn't, but it would be higher cost. So you, what you look for is shallow deposits that are amenable to open pit mining. That's just lower cost and easier to develop. Yeah, so this, this addresses one of the questions that I saw on, on Twitter that someone had, which was, could, could Elon Musk's boring company, the, the, the boring machines, be of use to mining these raw materials? It sounds like at least for lithium, that it's it wouldn't be needed. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be needed. It's really interesting. The boring company, just a very fascinating concept. So 
Uh, underground mining is very common around the world in other minerals. A lot of gold mining is done underground in, Can in Quebec, in South Africa, et cetera. Uh, so uh, underground, they're, they're tried and true ways to do underground mining, depending whether you're going after narrow vein material or bulk, or bulk materials underground. Uh, we won't have to do that. It's a big capital expenditure saving and it's a big operating cost saving. So our deposit, we can talk more later if we have time, but our, our deposit is quite shallow. Some of the big Australian deposits really get rich, mineral rich, below say 150 meters, 500 feet below surface. So to get down there to mine it, there's a lot of overburden you have to remove. That's kind of a capital cost, it's very expensive. And then you gotta send your trucks around in a circle to get down to the pit to get your material. Virtually all of our material is within 150 meters of surface uh, within. So we don't really even have any drill holes deeper than that. So that's a big advantage for us from a, from a cost of production perspective. Break down what that timeline looks like, because this is something that appears to be, we, we, we appear to be heading in a trajectory where we could potentially have more demand than there is supply for some of these raw materials, particularly lithium. So break down what that timeline looks like to discover an area Prove that it, uh, a feasibility study prove prove that there's there's actually uh, sufficient supply there, and then what what happens once you determine that and start mining it? Uh, it, it? It goes through several steps after it's taken from the ground. It does. I mean, the last step is the last part's pretty quick once you actually mining. But but as a rule of thumb, so again, I was an investment banker for a long time, worked with dozens and dozens of mining companies, and as a rule of thumb from from you know having your first drill hole and dr drill intercept where you where you found gold or copper or whatever you're chasing, to having an operating mine, typically ten year minimum rule of thumb. Uh, you know every now and then you have a very special deposit or a special commodity where you want to move more quickly, and lithium is an example potentially of that. Uh, but typically it takes a long time. You know the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out where you're going to drill, and you know, imagine this you're on you're on land in North Carolina and. 50 meters, you know, 150 feet down below the surface, there's a, you know, a lot of lithium, but you know, where exactly? And, and they're, they're, I'm, not, I'm not a geologist, but there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of drilling. We've done over 55,000 meters of drilling uh, in this belt. We have a lot, you know, we're gonna do a lot more because we think the deposit can be a lot bigger. But it takes a long time to kind of prove up a resource, mineral resource, to prove that you actually have something. Then when you do the drilling, you pull the core out of the, out of the ground and you, uh, you you retain half of it for, for uh, you know quality control purposes. You send the other half to a lab to be assayed. So they assay, they assay uh, all the core, and you know precisely uh, exactly where 10 meters, 100 meters, 150 meters down, and whatever you know angle, where your lithium is, and what are the materials are there, and you build kind of this 3D model, uh, exploration model of your your property. And then you begin to build mining plans around that. You say, okay, fine. So I have an ore body. And in our case, we have 27.9 million tons at 1.11% Li2O. So just a, you know, a bunch of numbers, but what, you know, that's, a, that's a world-class in scale, world-class in grade, high-grade asset in North Carolina. The question is, how do you mine it? Is it all, uh, is it all at surface? Is it deeper? Is it one you know, vein, essentially, or multiple veins? You build a mine plan around it, you build economics. So you're trying to determine whether it's economically feasible to extract the lithium. There are, well, in the mining business, there are, there are more deposits than there are economic deposits. It's, you know, there are lots of copper projects and gold projects and other projects that are, that where there's a lot of gold and copper, but it's quite possible they'll never be extracted because just geologically or politically or wherever they are, it'd be, uh, it, you, you know, you, you can't, you couldn't generate an economic return. So you do the economics. You do a lot of metallurgy, where again, the, you know, you take you take your you take samples of your ore, uh, and you test to make sure you can you know release the ore from the host mineral and actually have you know, produce a, in our case a six percent spodumene concentrate. We've proven that, but that's an effort you have to go through, and it takes time. So there's a lot of those studies. You have to permit the project, and you have to fund the project to finance it. So we're pretty far down the road. We've received our, the only federal permit we'll need for our mine and concentrate plant. Um, we do have some state permitting to do and, and some other work to do. We're working on that now. Uh, so we hope to be in a position, say, middle of next year, middle of 2021, where we'd be in a position to push the button and build and construct the operation. And then for the mine and concentrate plant, it'll probably take nine months to a year to get up and running. Uh, so that's just the mine and concentrate plant. You then have the chemical plant side of the business. So in simplest terms, in lithium, if you think about your Tesla on one side and your mining operation on the other, you got a mine, which ultimately produces a mineral concentrate. So 
Think of that as taking a lot of big rock out of the ground, crushing it, grinding it, and concentrating it, upgrading it essentially, separating it from the other material to kind of a sand or gravel consistency. That's the concentrate, 6% concentrate. So that comes to the mine. You then take that to a lithium plant, lithium hydroxide plant. So we intend to have a mine and hydroxide plant. The material then, the lithium hydroxide would then go to be delivered to a cathode plant. Cathode material would be made to go to a battery plant and then the battery would go into the car. So in simplest terms, there, there are five steps. There are more in, in there, but, but it's, really, it's really five simple steps. Uh, we're gonna do the first two of those. We're gonna build a, a mine and produce a concentrate. We're also gonna build a lithium hydroxide plant in North Carolina, and it's an, a very advantageous place to do it. And that process takes time as well. Right, right, yeah, I can imagine. Is that common for, for mining companies to do both processes, to, to crush it into the gravel and then to, to process it? Uh, it's certainly common for mining companies to take the raw material, the ore, out of the ground, put it in and, and concentrate it or separate it or refine it up to a certain standard where they then have a product they could sell. So in lithium, uh, in Western Australia, uh, well, you know, let me go back in time. So in North Carolina, when Albemarle and Livent's predecessors were mining, they were also producing at the time mostly lithium carbonate. So they each had refineries, they took the con their own concentrate, they put it in their own Car carbonate plant produced lithium carbonate, and I think some hydroxide back back in the day, but pre pre electric vehicles. Um, today, most of the concentrate, well, all the sponge, virtually all the sponge mean concentrate that's currently being produced is being produced in Western Australia, the state of Western Australia. Uh, virtually all of that is shipped into China to be converted into lithium hydroxide or carbonate by Chinese converters, and and, and a couple of Americans, like an Albemarle who operate in China as well. Um, so right now, uh, you basically have, again, you have mining, hydroxide plant, cathode battery cars. In the, uh, in the spodgeming business today, most of the guys are just at the mining end. They're producing a mineral concentrate, they're selling that. Uh, some have considered going further downstream. So Kidman Resources, which is a company that was acquired by West Farmers, a big Australian conglomerate almost a year ago. Kidman had a business plan very similar to ours. They were ahead of us. Uh, we've, you know, we're catching up to where they were, but they had a very large ore body. Uh, they brought SQM in as a partner to help build and operate that, but they intended to go downstream to produce lithium hydroxide. And that I believe is the plan that West Farmers and SQM, now the partners uh, have. That's a business model we have followed. We think it's the best business model, particularly if you're in a location like North Carolina. Uh, you think about it, uh, right now, uh, again, all the concentrate, virtually all the concentrate in the world goes into China. It's produced into lithium hydroxide. 83% of the world's hydroxide comes from China. Uh, the world wants material from somewhere else. There's no better place to do it than North Carolina. We have a world-class mineral deposit and we have a, you know, it's the United States. It's a Southeastern United States. It's a wonderful industrial uh, place to operate. Uh, First-class labor force, great, you know, low, low power costs, amazing infrastructure, um, just a lot of talent, know how to produce chemicals, a lot of customers nearby, a reasonable tax environment. I mean, it's, it's in our view, by far the best place in the world to do this. And uh, we're very fortunate. And um, our, our view is we can build our own mine and concentrate plant, convert that material to lithium hydroxide. And we've also introduced this idea of being a merchant producer where we would potentially buy spodumene from others around the world who might bring it into, into North Carolina for us to uh, produce more hydroxide. So it's a big opportunity, we think. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there are some, some interesting potentials there for you to sort of run with it. Seems like there's a lot of runway there for, for you to uh, in, increase revenue and profits. There's also a lot of electric vehicle uh, happenings around this area too, whether it be automotive makers uh, agreeing to, to define some sort of manufacturing area or plant produce electric vehicles. Uh, the proximity that you are to these locations in the South, I mean, in even, even Tesla producing vehicles in Texas and in California, it's a far better distance, uh, it's a far more appealing distance than to take these, these uh, raw materials and ship them from South America or China to, to the United States. So it seems like you're positioned quite well to go a couple of different directions there. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question that just sort of, as I'm saying this out loud, seems to be a possibility. Is, is there room for a large automotive maker who's serious about electric vehicles to acquire a company like Piedmont? Is that on the table or, or 
is, is that not in the picture at the moment? We certainly haven't had that kind of conversation. Uh, there's a Chinese auto company named Great Wall Motors, who's a shareholder in Pilbara Minerals. Pilbara has a big uh, spodge mead business in Western Australia. Uh, they're you know great company, uh, and I think what's gonna I think it's gonna be interesting. You mentioned demand earlier and the disconnect between demand and supply. Certainly in lithium, we actually had too much supply starting a couple of years ago. There were three big Australian projects that came online. Before you know, EV sales were really ramping up, and at the time it was really only Tesla. Now it's more and more people. Uh, I, I personally think what's going to happen is you're going to see. Um, I think you're going to see demand go near vertical. Now this is something for lithium or, or for EVs, I should say. Now this is something you would know better than me, and I know you comment on this frequently. But I'm a Tesla driver. I bought my Model Three November 20, 2018, best car I've ever owned. I, I love it. I, you know, I, I I tell anyone that that's interested, uh, it's irrational in my view to buy. To, buy, to not to buy a Tesla, if, you, if, if that's the kind of vehicle you want. I wanted a luxury sports sedan. Um, over, you know, it won't be too long where Ford will have the F-150, you know, Rivian, uh, Nikola, all these, uh, Tesla, the Cybertruck, there'll be all kinds of other options out there for people. And I think you're, we're gonna get to a point where you're gonna go into your auto dealer and you're gonna wanna buy a BMW 5 Series, you wanna replace your car, say, or you're gonna wanna buy a Honda Civic or a Ford F-150. And there's gonna be the traditional gasoline model, which is, great vehicle, um, which is going to cost pretty much what it costs today. And then there's going to be a shiny new electric version over here in the corner, which is going to cost less. And it's going to cost, as you know, far less to fuel and maintain. And it's just going to be a cooler car. Everyone's going to want that new car. No one's going to want to take the older technology, especially when they think about residual value, if they're leasing or well, or the terms, if they're leasing or, or whatever. I think it's, I think it's game changer. So what that means is I think I think we get by 2025, if not earlier, to a point where there are several good options of, of electric vehicles, no matter what kind of vehicle you want to drive. Pickup truck, you know, minivan, um, BMW 5 Series. And the electric cars are going to be attractive. They're going to be affordable. People are going to want them. There's precisely zero chance the world can produce enough lithium in that time period to support, you know, that kind of, pe the pe kind of penetration that will be there. So I think you're going to have a situation where uh, EV demand is going to go vertical. It's going to go through the roof. And between 2025 and 2030, it's going to go like Tony Siba has said. It's going to go to 100%. Everyone's going to want the cars. There's zero chance um, the lithium supply chain can develop on that timeline. So how, do, how, how does that change? How, how, does, how does the market, how do investors, how do governments help accelerate that or shorten that timeline so that we can all avoid a, a shortfall in supply yeah it's a great it's a great question so there's this whole concept of incentive pricing so you know for, for that leaving governments aside for now but uh, um, lithium prices you know say in the simplest terms spodge mean concentrate prices I don't know where they are right now we're not producing right now but they're they're say in the low to mid 400s in Western Australia um, so if you're a producer today you might be able to cover your cash costs at that well you might uh, you may or may not you may be bleeding cash Depends on your balance sheet, I guess. But there's nobody, there's nobody who's going to build a plant based on those prices. Though, because if you put those prices into your model, the returns are insufficient to kind of raise the capital. So I think what I think, so we started, we segued here because you asked a question about whether a car company might get into the lithium business, you know, the upstream business. And I don't know if one will or not, but I, I think it's, I, I, have, I have a point of view that one or more of the major car companies who are not yet leaders in EVs, but all know they need to be. And when I say one or more, virtually they're, they're all laggards, right? So, you know, Ford, GM, Fiat Chrysler, VW is moving hard, but BMW, Daimler, they're all, they're all, they, have, they all have a lot of work to do. And arguably, um, you know, th th and there's a lot of challenge for them in terms of software, you know, battery management, uh, design, you know, all the stuff that Tesla has been so good at, that they have to work hard at. Um, but fundamentally, one of the key uh, things they might they might be able to control is raw material supply. And you know, if I was a big car company and I controlled someone's raw and I controlled world class raw material supply, in, in a way that no one else could get it, no, none of my competitors could get it. That to me would be very appealing. So we've ha we haven't had any conversations with any car companies along those lines. I'd be surprised if if those conversations don't happen with some car companies and some lithium companies at some point over the next couple of years. Um, we'd be open to that, but you know, time will tell. It, it seems to make the most sense. And the example that I've used before is traditionally, 
the way that the way that automobiles used to be made is you could you could sell a an automobile a product a final product without needing to to have a gas in the tank you could have a little bit of gas in the tank but but if you don't have if you don't have the fuel for electric vehicles you're not going to be able to sell a unit so it makes sense to me for automakers to start to to secure those raw materials, the fuel for electric vehicles, because without them, you sell zero units or you get severely capped, which is what, what we saw last year with some of these other automakers where you couldn't, you couldn't get a, an e-tron or an EQC or, or an I-PACE in Europe because yeah. the supply for raw materials was limited. No, it's true. It's, it's for funny you say that. Those are the three examples I use all in Europe, you know, Jaguar, Audi and, Daim and Mercedes, and they all whether it was true or not, they never publicly said it, but there were there were rumors in all cases that they they just couldn't get enough batteries from LG. It was always LG. LG is a you know brilliant company, a very big battery producer, and putting a lot of capital in to grow more. But uh, just keep, you know keeping up with demand. What what I think is fascinating is that was that was 2019. Uh, demand for EVs in 2019 was de minimus essentially compared to what it'll even be. I mean, Europe now demands up almost 100% year to date from last year, which is fantastic. Uh, that's just going to keep growing and this problem is going to get ex exacerbated. And it's not today a problem of lithium supply. Uh, there's, 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 there's lithium supply out there for people who need it now. It's going to be a problem. If you think about the, if you just, if you look at any reasonable projections about EV sales in 2023 or four, and the battery requirements for those. These batteries are generally bigger. Uh, they're gonna generally use more hydroxide. Um, and the lithium requirements, hydroxide demand is gonna grow, you know, we think 30, 40% plus per year for at least a decade. It's really sig very significant numbers. Um, and I think when you look at that, I mean, I remember having a conversation with the CEO of a chemical company who said to me, he said, lithium is really attractive. Where else can you get 40% EBITDA margin through the cycle? in a business growing 30% a year at the top line. It's very hard to find that in outside of the technology world in, in a kind of more mundane mining chemical business. So I think car companies are gonna have to look. I think oil companies are gonna be interested in this. I think chemical companies who aren't in lithium are gonna look at this. Um, I think it's gonna be really interesting. And again, I come back to the point that Piedmont, we're in North Carolina, so we're American with spot, spodumene to hydroxide in the US. We think that will, um, we think one day our shareholders will see real benefit from all that. I'm just so fascinated by the potential here. The the upside is huge. Um, so sort of back back to the question that I asked a, a moment ago regarding securing these raw materials. Actually, even to take it a, a step further, what what do so automakers are going to need to look further down the supply chain to make sure that they're securing enough of of the raw materials to to produce electric vehicles. This is for certain. So how can automakers, investors, governments, how do they make sure that, that they're securing those raw materials in the volume that is going to be needed here? We're guessing in terms of what demand is going to be like, but it appears like it's going to be hockey stick growth. What, what do people need to do? What do organizations and governments need to do, investors need to do to make sure that there is not a shortage of supply of these raw materials like lithium. Yeah, I think as we th as we think about it, we start with from our the customer perspective. So you, you hit on a good point. The car companies fundamentally are the ones who worry about this. So they're they're investing billions of dollars, literally. They're designing cars they want to sell, and uh, they're working hard to develop orders for these vehicles. And that's that's happening now, but it's going to happen more and more as new vehicles come out. And and and. It's all dependent on them being able to produce the vehicles, which is not a problem they've really had in the last several decades. I mean, they've, they've, production is not, I'm sure it is challenging, but it's not their biggest challenge. Their biggest challenge is, is you know, producing something that their customers want more than maybe the other the competitors, but they, they can all produce. But there's a risk. I think there's no, there's no question that many car companies will struggle to get batteries. And there's a lot of things that go into batteries. Um, you know, lithium, nickel, manganese, graphite, you know, there's a lot of copper. There's a lot, there's a lot of different things that go in, materials that go into these. And, and uh, you know, there's an old buzzword, the mining business. It all begins with mining. You think about what goes into what stuff happen. And I think um, 
Traditionally, as of a couple of years ago, if you were a lithium producer, your customer was a cathode manufacturer. It's natural. The, cut, the lithium leaves a chemical plant, goes to a cathode manufacturer who makes the cathode active materials, which goes into the battery cell. So you sell to a cathode producer, like a you know, Sumitomo Metal Mining or a BASF. They produce the material. They sell to a battery company like a Panasonic or an LG. They take that. They sell it to a car company like Tesla. Now it's been turned around a little bit, and the car companies are the ones on the. They're the ones at the end of the day. They have to deliver to their. They want to deliver to their customers, so they're increasingly trying to get their arms around raw material supply. Just like Ford and GM traditionally would have uh, PGM procurement, you know, platinum group metals. You need palladium in a catalytic converter um, for pollution control purposes. So these companies have raw material procurement teams that procure that from Russia, South Africa, Canada, wherever they can find it. Uh, they all have the same now in lithium raw materials. So the big car companies, the big battery companies are all out there looking to secure supply. They're most focused on the near term, you know, who can, who can supply me next year or the year after, and that's not us. We're 2023 and beyond. And that's when the real hockey stick happens. So our timing we think is perfect. Uh, but the car companies and battery companies are coming to us and we're going to them. So we know many of them. Uh, we just hired a new gentleman who joined our team July 1st, Austin Devaney. He spent a decade with Rockwood Lithium and Albemarle in similar capacity. He knows a lot of these people. Um, we've done a lot of work with them in the past, spent a lot of time in Korea and Japan where a lot of the leaders in the battery business are. Our whole business model is really ex-China, but I think you're going to see the other Asians, the Koreans and Japanese companies, are, they're, they're here now. That, I mean, Toyota is the biggest car company in the U.S. in terms of production. So the Korean battery companies are here and they're coming uh, with more capital. So we're close, we're close to a lot of those folks. And I think uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, part of the conversation we have with people is, you know, gee, our capital requirements are X. Uh, it would be really helpful if you not only committed to buy material from us. So if, if we have offtake agreements, if, if, if a Tesla or Ford or LG or Panasonic commit to buy material from us, that's something that we can take to the bank and borrow against. So that's helpful. If they furthermore could provide, you know, some sort of capital in injection of the project or prepay for some of the material, these prepayments happen periodically in the sector. So these are conversations that I'm sure every lithium producer and, and potential producer are having with potential customers. And I'm confident that sort of capital will be available for good projects in good locations, which we think we have. Um, so I, I think it'll, I think it'll, I think it'll generally take care of itself. But there will be periods, it, it, you know, it's. It's all going to happen fast. Nobody expected Tesla stock to be whatever it hits at eighteen hundred dollars this fast, and it's all it's all happening fast. And all the car companies are are kind of aggressively trying to chase them, and coming into this business, you have massive amounts of capital going into these new businesses. Rivian raised over five billion dollars in the last eighteen months. Nikola, who you're going to see tomorrow, um, Proterra, Bollinger, they're all these really great new vehicle business platforms, and. Uh, um, you know, I think I think between them all, there's going to be some great vehicles, and they will incentivize us. They'll find a way to incentivize us, or make it po possible for us to build our projects. This is really insightful, and and I feel like there's just so much more to cover. But I want to keep the the video at a at a respectable uh, length here. So we'll have to definitely either do a part two with you, or maybe we can bring in some of your geologists and te technical specialists to go even deeper, uh, because this really is just a, a Really nice foundation building block to some other conversations that, that I think we'll, we'll have. I do have one more question for you before we wrap up. Tesla's got their battery day coming. Um, you're, you're in this industry. What are, you, what are you theorizing? What do you think is going to happen? What's going to be the, the, the breaking news or the headline that, that really gets people's attention? I have absolutely no idea. And I think it's interesting to read the speculation on social media. Uh, I don't post on social media much, but I read a lot and I learn a lot on social media. Interestingly, but I, you know, I have, have absolutely no idea. I mean, I think I think the job they've done is 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 just so impressive. And um, I think maybe like a lot of initial folks, when I first thought about Tesla several years back, I was I was a skeptic. Uh, but it's just awesome to behold what Tesla has done. Leaving aside what you know Elon has done outside of Tesla, it's really. Uh, it's, it's really very impressive, and he is, in fact, doing what he wanted to do, which is he's changing the world, uh, the way he's changing the, the way people build cars and will consume cars. Uh, everyone is chasing him, and they all will. And, uh, and, I, and people talk about the, to me, the, to me, the most interesting thing about Tesla, in my experience, it, it, 
is is the culture of the place. And I, I visited, you know, we visited a lot of these potential customers, car companies, battery companies, and and when you go, so I spent 30 years on Wall Street, and and when you go into Palo Alto to see Tesla, which I did a, a year or so ago, the first reaction was that I was on the Goldman Sachs trading floor. There are hundreds of people with multiple screens in front of them, young, very smart people, very motivated, working 16-hour days because they believe in the cause. And that's just not what you typically see in a big industrial company. It's just different. And that's going to be hard for incumbent car companies to replicate, um, which is why I think a lot of these startups, the Rivians and the Nikolas, you know, they probably have a lot of similar talent and similarly motivated people. And, and I think some of them will succeed. Uh, because I think it becomes it's, it becomes a people business. I think what Tesla's proven is, it's 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 not impossible to build a car. It might take a while. You know, my 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 Model Three is perfect. I've never had any issues. But every now and then you read about the paint job or the finish or whatever. I haven't experienced that. But it's not hard to that's that can be conquered. The software updates that's a whole different story. <laughs> and and uh, uh, so who knows? I have no idea what they'll announce. But uh, but I'll be watching. It'll be interesting. That is the the, the question of the. Of, of the year, I think. I had a phone call before I got to the hotel with a, a guy I keep in close contact with who is a, an investor and an uh, enthusiast and he's, he's, we're having regular conversations these days about, you know, what does this mean? Could this, could this mean something potential, potentially significant? Is it gonna reduce the cost? And so I know a lot of us are really excited about it and I uh, can't, can't wait and hopefully it means something positive for, for Piedmont. Um, I'm really excited about that. And so uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up here. So Keith Phillips, CEO of, of Piedmont Lithium, thank you so much for taking some time to break it down in layman terms for uh, what, what, what lithium means for the electric vehicle industry. Sean, thanks for the opportunity. Really enjoyed talking to you and, uh, and look forward to following you further.